Thank you, Marshall. And our next speaker will be Kellen Baker. Thank you, Chris. And wow, that's going to be a tough act to follow, Marshall. Um, but my name is Kellen Baker. I'm from the Center for American Progress. And I just want to start off by acknowledging how grateful I am to be here. Marshall mentioned the convening power of CMS as one of the primary levers towards reducing disparities and achieving health equity. And it is not lost on me how important it is that LGBT disparities are part of the agenda today for two big reasons. One, because all of us who work on LGBT health disparities are deeply, deeply indebted to the movement for racial and ethnic health equity, not only in terms of the strategies that we use on a federal policy level or a state policy level or on a clinical setting, but really because it is this movement, it is all of you who have done that hard work of identifying disparities, defining health equity, and clarifying our moral duty as a country to address these disparities and achieve health equity for everyone. And so I do also just want to mention that regardless of where you are on morality issues, we know these are playing out in a big way on the public stage around LGBT populations, we are all here because we believe that health disparities are a moral failing of our nation. Everyone should have the right to be healthy, to be safe, to live in safe and healthy communities in a safe and healthy nation. And the same is true for LGBT folks. And the second reason why I'm so grateful and happy that I am here is really because we are talking about the realities of people's lives. It's not LGBT people over here and everyone else over there. People are living at the intersections of race, ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, gender and gender identity, age, all of these different factors that make up how healthy we are able to be, how safe our communities are. And our policies need to be living at those intersections, too. And really, if we look at the history of, for example, the HIV epidemic in this country, it is impossible to fully eradicate the disparities that are associated with race or ethnicity or any other disparity factor without also addressing the stigmatized sexual orientation and gender identity disparities that so many people are living with today. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about who LGBT communities are, just to make sure we're all on the same page. I know all the kids these days are coming up with their new language. I'm not as young as I look, I'm struggling to keep up. <laughs> so just to make sure we're all on the same page about some of the language I'm gonna be using, LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Sexual and gender minorities, you heard Chris mention, that is a synonym for LGBT. It's typically found more in the research world. It's important to know that the LGBT umbrella actually includes two distinct aspects of people's identities. The first is sexual orientation. And despite the presence of that fun little root word, sex, it's actually not really about sex. It's about who you love. It's about who you create a family with. It's about what your community structures and support look like. Some of the terms that are typically used to describe sexual orientation include heterosexual or straight. Yes, all of you who are straight, y'all have a sexual orientation. Gay or lesbian, bisexual. There are other terms as well, same gender loving, for example, in predominantly African American communities. The second big aspect of individual identity that's bound up in that LGBT umbrella is gender identity, which is each person's deeply felt internal knowledge of your own gender. So when you wake up in the morning, for most of us, we know we're a man, we know we're a woman. For some people, they may identify as a gender outside of that gender binary. That's your gender identity. And again, just like sexual orientation, all of us have one. It's just that LGBT folks usually have to spend a little bit more time thinking about sexual orientation and gender identity because, again, of the disparities that are associated with these aspects of identity. Some of the terminology around transgender folks, and I apologize for the small font on the screen, it's really a testament to all of the news that's coming out around transgender folks these days. Folks heard about the transgender tipping point. No one? Yes, thank you. Yes, the transgender tipping point, so-called, we're seeing so many more news stories and information coming out about transgender folks who are people whose gender identity, so that internal knowledge of their own gender, is different from what's typically associated with the sex that they were assigned at birth, which just means the sex that's on their original birth certificate. 
And I say original because it is possible in the United States, in most states, to change your birth certificate, as well as your driver's license, your passport, military ID, school records, all of these other things that we use to determine someone's legal sex and legal name. A transgender man or a trans man is someone who is assigned the female sex at birth but identifies and lives as a man. So transgender men grew up being told they were girls. They knew they identified as boys. When they grow up, they live as men. A transgender woman is a person who is assigned the female sex at birth, but, or I'm sorry, the male sex at birth, meaning on, the, on her original birth certificate, but identifies and lives as a woman. Gender queer and gender non-conforming typically refers to a person who identifies outside, again, of that binary. Some other terms you may have heard include two-spirit among predominantly Native American communities. Gender transition, that part, that thing that the media really loves to talk about, that process that a lot of transgender people go through to change from the sex that's on their original birth certificate to the sex that they identify as, to the sex that reflects their gender identity. Gender transition is different for everybody, but it typically includes a variety of legal steps, changing some of those ID documents, and medical steps, which is one of the big reasons why it's such an important thing to talk about health and health equity, not only in the context of lesbian, gay, bisexual issues, but particularly for trans folks. Here are some examples of trans people. If you have not been consuming media lately, you may have missed them, but if you've turned on your TV or opened up a magazine, you may have seen some of these faces. Janet Mock, for example, who has a show on MSNBC. Laverne Cox, a transgender actress on the cover of Time magazine. The woman on the, I suppose, what would she be, the top right for all of you? That is my friend Regina from Colorado. Regina is a transgender woman who, before the Affordable Care Act, was on the verge of having to sell her house because she couldn't get health insurance coverage because as a transgender person, she was just locked out of coverage entirely. That meant she couldn't get coverage for her hormone therapy. She also couldn't get coverage for her asthma medications, which were actually way more expensive. When she transitioned, she lost pretty much everything. Her marriage, her children became estranged, her job. And again, she was on the verge of losing her house because of those medical bills that were mounting. Under the Affordable Care Act, she was actually able to get a plan that covers everything she needs, does not lock her out of coverage as a transgender woman, and today she actually travels around the country with me to various events talking about the difference that the Affordable Care Act has made for her. So how big of a population are we talking about here? Some people think it's like 45% of the US population is LGBT. Some people <laughs> think it's practically no one. The answer is really, as, at least as far as we know, somewhere in between. These data are from the Gallup poll analyzed by the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law, and they found that more than 8 million Americans identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Then, in addition, another 700,000 Americans who identify as transgender. That means there are at least 9 million LGBT Americans living all across the country today, and it's important to know that this is probably a serious undercount because we as a society, as we know, are not to, the are not to the place where it is safe for everyone to come out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender. So this means that there are actually probably a significantly larger number of people who would actually fall under that LGBT umbrella. Nine million LGBT Americans, population of New Jersey. Who here cares about New Jersey? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. So this is a sizable population we're talking about. And as I mentioned, LGBT folks live all across the country. There are no states where there are no LGBT people. No surprises that the largest populations are in the states with the biggest populations, right? California, Texas, Florida, New York. But LGBT people are everywhere. These 9 million LGBT folks also include close to 650,000 same-sex couples who identified themselves on the last census, and that number is only going to go up now that couples in every state are able to get married. And one thing that I just want to pause on before I go on to talk more about LGBT health disparities is that it is really not appropriate in a lot of ways that I am the one sitting here talking about this because I am just some white dude and I am not actually representative of the faces of the LGBT community. 
If you trust the media, you'd think this is what LGBT looks like. Actually, that's what LGBT looks like. We are parents, we are communities of color, we are immigrants, we are young folks, we are old folks, we are benefiting from the Affordable Care Act, that big photo down there, those are 10 LGBT identified people who are either navigators or beneficiaries of the Affordable Care Act from eight different states who came to meet with the Surgeon General to talk about the importance of the ACA in their communities. And the woman on the bottom there with the uh, shiny little where to start, what to ask pamphlet, which is intended to help LGBT people in insurance enrollment, her name is Aurora. She works for the Lesbian Health Initiative of Houston. She got coverage under the Affordable Care Act and she spends her days talking to her fellow LGBT community members about why prevention and wellness, particularly in the context of cancer, are so important for LGBT community members. So as different as we all are in the LGBT community or LGBT communities, there are a couple of trends or threads that continue to unite us as far as the common experiences that many LGBT folks have when they're trying to navigate aspects of daily life like getting healthcare. Some of the big factors that contribute to LGBT health disparities include anti-LGBT bias and discrimination, full stop. People treating LGBT people badly because of who they are. Racism and other forms of structural discrimination such as sexism and the way we treat immigrants in this country. A lack of legal recognition for relationships and actually in terms of gender uh, identity and transgender people being able to get an ID document that shows who you really are. That's really important for things like going to the doctor, voting, being stopped by the police, and not having it be escalated even further than it might already be. Poverty, homelessness, up to 40% of the, of, I'm sorry, out of, up to 40% of the US out of home youth population identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer, or questioning. These are young folks that are kicked out of their houses, rejected by their families because of who they are. That has health impacts all the way through the rest of their lives. Lack of insurance coverage, which is something I'll talk about in a little bit more detail momentarily, and a lack of LGBT cultural competency. So just to go through a couple of these very briefly in turn, poverty. Again, the media representations of the LGBT population is that we're all wealthy white dudes living in San Francisco or wherever and have no problems. <laughs> Not actually true. LGBT people are generally more likely than the US population to be living in poverty, particularly if they're LGBT people of color, particularly if they're parents, particularly if they are a female same-sex couple because you take two people who are dealing with sexism and making 77 cents per every man's dollar, you put them together in a family, those disparities multiply. This data is from research that the Center for American Progress did in 2014. We talked with LGBT folks across the country who had incomes under 400% of the federal poverty level, so those people who are potentially eligible for financial assistance to get coverage under the Affordable Care Act. And when we looked at the breakdown of incomes in that zero to 400% range, as you can see, we found that it wasn't evenly distributed at all. In fact, 61% of those folks we talked to had incomes under 139% of the federal poverty level. That is just one of the reasons why Medicaid expansion is such a critical, critical issue for LGBT communities across the country. A second big social determinant of LGBT health, discrimination. This is still happening. These are data from 2013. This is the Pew Research Center. So this isn't just me walking down the street asking my friends what kind of experiences they've had. This is nationally representative data in 2013 of the kinds of things that LGBT people are still encountering. Being treated unfairly by their employer, receiving poor service in a place of public accommodation, even being threatened or physically attacked. And this is a major problem, not just for LGBT people generally, but the birth of the modern LGBT rights movement, if you will, is typically held to be the Stonewall Riots. In 1969, almost 50 years ago, those folks who rioted at the Stonewall Inn launched a national movement for recognition of who LGBT people are and the rights that we need to have. Those folks are baby boomers. They are booming right into Medicare they are booming right into long-term care, 
and a lot of them are encountering discrimination such as being forced to hide who they are. Maybe they've been out for years, they go into a long-term care setting, and it's no longer safe for them to have a partner or a girlfriend or a boyfriend visit. It's no longer possible for them to live as an openly transgender person. There are some protections in the PACE program, for example, has non-discrimination protections on the basis of sexual orientation, but there is still no comprehensive set of non-discrimination protections that will make sure that as LGBT folks age, that they are not actually losing everything that they have fought for decades to secure. In terms of trying to get health care, this is data from a study, unfortunately, but appropriately called When Healthcare Isn't Caring. This is a nationally representative study of almost 5,000 LGBT people and people living with HIV. Almost 8% of people being refused health care they needed on the basis of their sexual orientation. 26.7%, more than a quarter of transgender people just being turned away in a doctor's office because we don't treat people like you. Healthcare professionals refusing to touch people or using excessive precautions, using harsh or abusive language. More than 20% of transgender people report encountering harsh or abusive language from a healthcare provider. And even almost 8% of transgender people encountering healthcare professionals who are physically rough or abusive. These are the realities of LGBT people's lives today. And finally, of course, on insurance, Across the board, this is across all income ranges, LGBT people significantly more likely than the general population to be uninsured. This is from the middle of 2013 to the middle of 2014. You can see the decline. Thanks, Affordable Care Act. <laughs> Woo! But still, LGBT people being more likely to be uninsured, and that's particularly true for those folks from zero to 400% at the federal poverty level. In 2013, more than one in three, 34% were uninsured. By 2014, that number had dropped a lot to 26%, but that still means that in 2014, more than one in four LGBT people who could get financial help to get covered still didn't have insurance. All of these factors contribute to these health disparities, tobacco and other substance use, higher rates, particularly among gay and bisexual men, up to twice as likely as the general population to use tobacco and other substances. Mental health concerns, such as depression and suicidal ideation. According to Injustice at Every Turn, which is a study on the transgender population, 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide, at least once. That's a rate 26 times higher than the general population. Higher rates of certain cancers, such as breast cancer among lesbian and bisexual women, compounded by the fact that it's harder for them to get access to preventive screenings because they're less likely to have insurance, Higher rates of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. The HIV epidemic isn't over for anybody. It's really not over for LGBT folks, particularly gay and bisexual men, particularly gay and bisexual men of color. Gay and bisexual men, about 2 to 3% of the US population, 65% of new HIV infections, 55% of new AIDS diagnoses, and 45% of the deaths from AIDS since the epidemic began more than 30 years ago. And in 2008 to 2010, this is just some of the most recent data that's available, HIV among young, black, gay, and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men increased 20% in two years. And higher rates of experiences of bullying, violence, and abuse, particularly transgender people, right here, in the Baltimore and DC metro area is an extremely dangerous place for transgender women, particularly transgender women of color. There have been 20 transgender women murdered already this year. Several of them right here, Baltimore, DC, predominantly women of color. Backwards, forwards. So fortunately, that's like depressing, 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 depressing. I'm sorry, I'm going up, I promise. There's a lot that's happening, and I know I have to wrap up my time too. There's a lot that's happening on the federal policy level that is actually helping us get a handle on some of these disparities and address them. These are just some of the many things that have happened. Healthy People, for example, Healthy People 2020, has a new LGBT health topic area that talks explicitly about discrimination, oppression, and stigma in driving health disparities among LGBT folks. 
Two Institute of Medicine reports, one in 2011 on general LGBT health disparities, and one in 2012 on collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data in clinical settings. The Joint Commission, ARC, SAMHSA, the Office of Minority Health, the Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services Standards, the CLASS Standards, woo, love the CLASS Standards. Really? Come on. Mara Udelman, you clap. There we go. <laughs> they actually include sexual orientation and gender identity in that blueprint, the implementation blueprint, as some of the factors that need to be looked at when you're providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And of course, the Affordable Care Act. So four priority health topic areas, LGBT health topic areas that I'm gonna talk about briefly, starting off with data collection. Because if everyone noticed, one of the primary things that Marshall mentioned when he was talking about interventions, it all started with data. Well, guess what? We don't really have the data that we need to actually talk about where do we need to go with LGBT health disparities. We know they exist, we know how bad they are, but we don't have the data we need to actually really get a handle on fixing things. So there are four main places, or spheres of LGBT data collection, if you will. Research, population surveys, administrative and program data, such as the health insurance marketplace application, and clinical records, especially electronic health records. None of these areas of data collection currently collect sufficient data, actually currently really collect any data at all about sexual orientation and gender identity. That needs to change. These are just some of the aspects of LGBT identity that are wrapped up in this universe of LGBT data. Identity, attraction, and behavior. Your relationship status, that's actually a data point related to sexual orientation. Transgender status, your current gender identity, as distinct from the sex that you were assigned at birth, and preferred name and pronoun. Second, and actually I should say, my slides will also be available, so please feel free to take this home as a blueprint for implementation collecting more and better data on LGBT populations. ACA implementation, Medicaid and marketplace enrollment in particular, non-discrimination in health coverage and care. Kara mentioned earlier the section 1557 regs that include gender identity and sex stereotyping. We need those to be adopted in the final rule and we need that final rule to make sure that it mentions sexual orientation because as we saw, people are still encountering all of these barriers to coverage and care. Trans-inclusive coverage in public and private coverage programs. Actually, one of the biggest steps here was made by the Medicare program last year. They lifted the transgender-specific exclusion that had prevented transgender people from getting coverage for gender transition under Medicare, and a lot of other insurance programs are starting to follow. And coverage to care for marginalized patient populations, particularly LGBT folks of color. So this is just an initiative that I run out of CAP out to enroll, you should please feel free to visit us, outtoenroll.org. We will be at the US Conference on AIDS on Thursday talking about LGBT outreach strategies among communities of color, in particular for reducing HIV disparities. Public health policies, funding and programs, all of the different policies and programs at HHS, at state health departments across the country, recognition that LGBT is a health disparity population and an underserved population. The Office of Minority Health at HHS has a number of great publications about that. HIV prevention and treatment, population-specific issues. I mentioned some of the things that are facing LGBT elders as they age into long-term care settings. And cultural competency requirements tied to program funding. It really should not be permissible in the year 2015 for service providers to be able to choose whether or not they're going to treat LGBT people like human beings. And finally, medical education. For you doctors out there, think back. There's an average of only five hours of LGBT content in medical education. The majority of that is on HIV and AIDS among gay men. Clinicians talk to me a lot about a lack of both cultural and clinical competency in LGBT health. And in particular, there's a real lack of, lack of knowledge around transgender health in particular. So fortunately, there are some steps forward to rectify that. The AAMC, for example, published these guidelines in 2014 implementing curricular and institutional climate changes to improve healthcare for individuals who are LGBT, gender nonconforming, or born with DSD, which is disorders of sex development, which is a more medicalized term for intersex. So the takeaway, marriage equality happened. This is very exciting for a lot of LGBT folks, but we cannot forget 
the so many other faces of our community who are still having trouble getting coverage, still having trouble getting care, who really need all of the kinds of innovations and advances that you are all committed to and that we are talking about here today. So thank you.